Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul, he said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Hallelujah. Now, when Paul the apostle here, he said, stand fast, therefore, you always, you want to know what the therefore is there for. Amen. In other words, in light of what has just been said, and for those of you uh, who weren't with us the previous service, uh, we were teaching in Galatians chapter 4, and the Apostle Paul was dealing with Ishmael and Isaac, and how Ishmael is a type of the flesh, and Isaac is a type of the spirit. And then Paul said here, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Now those words stand fast there, it, they are a present active imperative, which means to keep on standing in the freedom in which Christ has made you free. Again, to keep on standing in the freedom in which Christ has made you free. In other words, don't let anything rob you of your freedom in Christ Jesus. Don't let anything steal the freedom away from you that you found in Jesus Christ. Now, in context, you know that this is exactly what the issue was with the church of Galatia. They had that freedom in Christ, but it was being stripped away from them through legalism, through a workspace relationship with God and through the false teaching of the Judaizers. And so Paul was saying here, don't let anything steal the freedom of Christ from you. How many people in the church world today, are they're saved, they're born again, but they're not living in freedom. That they came to Jesus and they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But sometime along the way, something or somebody stripped away that freedom that they once had in Christ. Maybe it, it, they, they got caught up in a religious church. In a church that, that was full of man-made traditions and religions. You know, some seminaries out there do not equip people for the work of God, but they actually strip away what that child of God once had when they got saved. There's a saying that some seminaries are cemeteries. They're dead. You know, people get saved and they get born again and they, they accept Jesus and then they get around the wrong people and that freedom is stripped away from them because they tell them, yes, believing was enough to save you, but now you've got to keep our religious uh, traditions and you've got to look like us and you've got to act like us. And then before they know it, the freedom that they once felt just begins to dissipate, begins to deteriorate. I remember when I first got saved, there was just a simple love for Jesus. It was, it was undefiled. It was pure. It was just out of a simple love for God. <clears throat> but there came a point in time where somebody said, if you want to be properly discipled, then you've got to keep this program and you've got to go through level 101 and level 201 and level 301 and level 401 of this program. In case you're wondering, I didn't get through level 101, but I'm still discipled by the grace of God. Hallelujah. I'm still living for Jesus without that program. But I remember I got through the first week that told you, actually, I didn't even complete the first week. The first week was no conversational texting. And so if you had an important text message uh, a business text or whatever the case you could text, but no conversational texting. And then it was no hot showers for a week. And then it was no sweets. And then it was an hour of sleep a day for a week straight. 
And I, I remember that first week of trying to keep that program. It was seemingly a good thing. It, it, it came from a church. And so I wanted to get closer to God. And so what happened is I began to keep that program. But it wasn't helping my relationship with God. It actually made me feel further away from God. <clears throat> Because that liberty that I once had from Christ was slowly disappearing. It was no longer, I was no longer reading the word just to know Jesus. I was reading the word of God to complete level 101. So that way I could get an award in front of a church and everybody could clap their hands. I don't care about a, a, a reward. I don't care about the awards of men. I just want to know Jesus. And you don't have to go through a program to know Jesus. Jesus is with you and Jesus is in you. And Paul said, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Don't let anybody or anything take that freedom away from you that you once found in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Stand fast. Continue to stand. You have been set free from the law and from sin and you are free in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he said this, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. That word entangled there speaks to be placed in a controlled area. And the idea is really like a fish caught up in a fishing net. It's, it's like a prisoner locked up in a cell. Paul said, be not entangled again. With the yoke of bondage. You were already entangled in sin. And you were already entangled in bondage before you got saved. But now that you have found liberty in Christ Jesus. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Do not go back to that controlled area. Have you ever been in that place where, where you're saved but you feel like a fish caught up in a net? There's no freedom. There's no, there's no liberty. You're, you're bound by, by law, by religion. It says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Yes. So it's like, once again, like being a prisoner in a prison cell. And here, that which is entangle, entangling you is the law. Paul here, he's talking about the law. He's talking about going back to living under the law as a means of righteousness. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. And then he said this in verse 30. He said, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. For my yoke is easy in verse 30. And my burden is light. And so you can either be under the yoke of bondage, which is the law. Which is a, is a yoke that is too great for us to bear. It's too heavy for us to carry. But Jesus said, all you've got to do is come unto me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then Paul said in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 2. He said, behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised that Christ shall profit you nothing. Now it's interesting. He said that Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, I want to make it clear that this is referring to one's condition here on earth and not one's position in Christ. Again, when Paul said that Christ shall profit you nothing, this is speaking of one's condition here on earth and not one's position in Christ. And the reason why that's important is to know that if somebody is in a time in their life where they fall into law, they don't automatically lose their salvation. 
They don't automatically lose their position in Christ, but it will affect your condition in Christ here on, the, here on this earth. And many of you have heard us explain the difference between position and condition. Positionally, the moment you believed in Jesus, you were placed in Jesus, and he is perfect. And so your position in Jesus is 100% perfect. But our condition on this earth, it goes up and down. We have good days and we have bad days. The Bible says that if we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so the reason why we need mercy and grace, the reason why his mercies are new every morning is because we're still being changed. It's because we're still imperfect. It's because we still have sin in our life. And so the sanctification process is God taking our condition which is imperfect and inconsistent and bringing it closer and closer to our position in Christ, which is 110% perfect. And so that's an ongoing process until we're glorified. And so when Paul said Christ shall profit you nothing, he's not saying that you lose your position in Christ, but he's saying that your condition in Christ is going to be inhibited. It's going to, it's, it's going to be affected that the power of Jesus Christ is not going going to be operating in your life as it should. He said, Christ shall profit you nothing. And so in other words, if one comes under law of any kind in order to spiritually grow or to get victory over sin or to be righteous in God's sight, then Christ will be of no benefit to us. If we're trusting in anything to get victory over sin other than Christ and what he's already done for us at Calvary, then Christ shall profit you nothing. If you could get victory over sin through what you do, through the flesh, then Jesus, the Bible says, has died in vain. That word profit, it says, shall profit you nothing. That word profit, it means to prevail, to benefit to assist, or to be useful. Again, to prevail, to benefit, to assist, or to be useful. And so this refers to the work of the Holy Spirit in us through what Christ has done at the cross, giving us victory over our sinful nature. And so when we're going back to the law and we're trusting in the law, Paul said that if you're not just circumcision, but really any aspect of the law that we're trying to keep as a means of righteousness, the Bible says Christ shall profit us nothing, shall be of no benefit to us because the Holy Spirit cannot assist. He cannot prevail and he cannot benefit us when our faith is no longer in Christ Jesus. And then it says in verse three, it says, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And this is important. It's important to understand that anyone who is trying to keep any aspect of the law is a debtor to the whole law. In other words, a debtor is one who is obligated. Anyone who tries to keep a part of the law is then obligated to keep the entirety of the law. And as you know, It is impossible to keep the entirety of the law through the flesh. The law is perfect, 110% perfect. And as you know, we are very imperfect because of our sinful nature. And so it is completely impossible for imperfect human beings through the flesh to keep the perfect standard of God. The law was never intended to be uh, to, to give us righteousness through the flesh, but the law was intended to show us how unrighteous that we are, and it was intended as a schoolmaster to lead us to Jesus Christ. And so Paul said that, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. I shared with you all about how when I was in Miami last January, how I had a conversation with uh, several Jewish people, and I was asking them about their belief system. And, and can I just say this here tonight? When it comes to addressing doctrines out there in the world, it is critical that we actually understand what people believe and what people teach. You know, so often I hear people go on the offense and tear down preachers, and then it's like that that's not even what they believe. That's not even what they say. And so it's important to actually do some research. As one preacher said, do your Google due diligence, look it up 
And, and, and don't just go on the attack. You've got to actually know what people believe. And then when it comes to addressing false doctrine, then you can address it from the core and you can address it for what it is and not just accuse people of believing things that they don't actually believe. That always, that's always a, been a pet peeve of mine. And, you know, people just kind of hear rhetoric about certain preachers and just repeat it. And it's important to actually know what people believe because I know if it can happen to them, it, them, it can happen to me. I don't want people to say I believe something I don't actually believe. They need to actually know what I believe. And so I asked those Jewish people, I wanted to know what they actually believe. And I was asking them about sin. And it took a lot to get them to even admit that uh, there is sin within their community. But I was asking them what they do to be made righteous in the eyes of God. What do you do if you've fallen short and you know that God is perfect, then how do you as an imperfect person get up to the perfect righteousness of God? And I shared how they said that they fast depending on the sin and depending on Jewish tradition. But the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And the, the shedding of blood in the Old Testament through the sacrificial system was symbolic of the shed blood of Jesus Christ that would wash away every sin. And so if you're trusting in the law, if you're still trying to live, the, live by the law, but yet you don't have a sacrificial system, then there's no righteousness given unto the individual. And so that's why Jesus came. And so now by faith in Jesus and what he's done for us at Calvary, the righteousness of God is given to you and I. And so once again, he said, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And then he said this in verse four. He said, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Wheresoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Again, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, this last Sunday morning, I was preaching on that. I addressed that phrase, fallen from grace, because so, many, so often people think that if somebody commits an act of sin that they've fallen from grace. If they've fallen short, they like to say in the church world, uh, well, they have fallen from grace, but that's not what it means to fall from grace. Falling from grace is to take your faith outside of the source of grace, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so that means that one can be saved, they can be born again, fall short, and yet they're still in the grace of God. They haven't lost their salvation. Grace is intended to pick us up when we fall. The very nature of mercy and grace is that it can only go to people that deserve mercy and grace. The very nature of that, the meaning of mercy and grace is that it can only go to people. If, peop if we deserve mercy and grace, then we would then be unqualified to receive mercy and grace. And so the fact that God said my mercies are new every morning and that by his mercies you are not consumed is because he knew that you would need his mercy every single morning. And so it's okay to admit it's important that we do admit how much we are in desperate need of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ every day of our life. Amen. He said Christ has become of no effect unto you. Again, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Or uh, the New King James, you, you have become estranged from Christ. Now, the Greek word in this verse that's used for becoming of no effect or uh, being estranged means to make ineffective or to strip of one's power. To make of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to make ineffective or to strip of one's power. He said, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Now, what's interesting is the Greek word that's used there for, for uh, no effect is the same Greek word that is used in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 in reference to the sinful nature. If you go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, it says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin, speaking of sin the sin nature, might be done away with. And the word used for done away with, uh, card uh, geo, it means to make ineffective or to strip of one's power. And so in other words, when you got saved, 
the, the power of the sin nature. In the King James, it says that the sin nature might be destroyed. And the Greek word there, it means to strip of one's power. It means to, to make ineffective. And so it's the same Greek word that Paul uses back here in Galatians that says when you're uh, living under the law, then, then the power of Jesus Christ is stripped away from you. It, it's ineffective. In, in other words, you can either have law or you can have the power of the Holy Spirit, but you cannot have both. You can either live under the law for righteousness or you can have the power of the Holy Spirit, but you cannot have both. If you're living under the law, then Christ has become of no effect unto you. The power of Christ is then inactive to give you victory over sin in your life. You, do, you know, Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he said, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And the word used for frustrate, it means to interrupt the flow of. To make of none effect, or Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, I'm sorry. To make of none effect, to nullify. And so when you're trusting in something other than Christ and you are interrupting the flow of the Spirit of God. And so it's through the cross that the sin nature is made ineffective. It is stripped of its power. He said that you have become estranged. Going back to verse 4 of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. He said, Christ has become of no effect unto you. And so because one's faith is in something else other than the cross of Christ, he's saying your union with Christ is ineffective. The, the emphasis is on you have become ineffective. You have been stripped of Christ's power. And so this is a pretty serious thing when it comes to embracing law and embracing legalism. And, you know, so often in the church world, it's not even the Old Testament law that people are trying to live by, but there's self-made laws and church-made laws and man-made laws. And I like to say it like this, that if the Old Testament law is insufficient to give us victory in our lives, then how much more insufficient are man-made laws and self-made laws and church-made laws? If the Old Testament law could not give you righteousness and could not give us victory, then what makes us believe that we can create our own laws and we can adhere to uh, denominational and church-made laws and that through the keeping of those laws, we're going to be made righteous in the eyes of God? He said, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, Kenneth Wiest, that many of you are familiar with, the commentator, uh, I want to read this small paragraph to you from Kenneth Wiest. He said this, he said, the words Christ, Christ is become of no effect unto you must be understood in their context to refer not to their justification, but to their spiritual lives as Christians. The apostle is not here speaking of their standing, but of their experience. The words become of no effect are from the Greek words kardagio, which means to make ineffectual, and which use the word, which use with the word apo or from, uh, stay with me here, which means to be without effect from, to be unaffected by, or to be without effect of relation to. And so the word is applied to any destruction of growth or life, physical or spiritual. One could translate, you have become unaffected by Christ, or you have become without effective relation to Christ. And the idea is that the Galatian Christians, by putting themselves under law, have put themselves in a place where they have ceased to be in that relation to Christ, where they could de derive the spiritual benefits from him, which would enable them to live a life pleasing to him, namely through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thus, Christ has no more effect upon them in the living of their Christian lives. And so as believers, they had not completely lost their salvation, but their relationship with Christ had been seriously effective to where the power of Christ and the power, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit could not work and operate in their life as God intended to make them more like Jesus. He said, you have fallen from grace. Now the word fallen, it means to fall or to fall out of something, to fall 
or to fall out of something. The, the commentator A.T. Robert, Robertson, he says, he says it like this. You left the sphere of, of grace in Christ and took your stand in the sphere of law. Again, you left the sphere of grace in Christ and took your stand in the sphere of law. Now, what's interesting, as he said here, you are fallen from grace. Now, this is a completed action, meaning that you have already fallen out of grace and into law. In, in other words, it's not going to happen. It's already happened. Paul was telling these, these believer, believers in Galatia, it's not that you're going to fall out of the realm of grace, but these believers had already fallen outside of the realm of grace. Now, what is grace? Grace is God's goodness extended to undeserving people. Amen. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. Unmerited favor divine assi assistance and so by these believers resorting to the law they were not receiving the benefits of grace that God intended for them to experience they were interrupting the flow of those benefits and then he said in verse 5 he said this for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith for we through the Spirit, capital S, speaking of the Holy Spirit, for we, through the Holy Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Hallelujah. Tonight, are you living through, through the flesh or are you living through the Spirit? Are you walking after the Spirit? Are you walking according to the Spirit of God? For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And so when you live by faith, then and only then can you do things through the Spirit and by the means of the Spirit. When he said through the Spirit, he was saying by the means of the Spirit. And so we can either be living for God by the means of the flesh or we can be living for God by the means of the spirit. It says here, uh, we wait for the hope of righteousness, which really speaks of eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. Here it refers to the believer's intense desire for an eager expectation of a practical righteousness which will be constantly produced in his life by the Holy Spirit as he yields himself to him. I'm going to say that again because that's some good stuff here tonight. Amen. And repetition is our best teacher. Again, it refers to the believer's intense desire for an eager expectation of a practical righteousness which will be constantly produced in his life by the Holy Spirit as he yields himself to him. Now, now I want to talk about practical righteousness here for a moment. Practical righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness just simply means that which is right. Now, we know that the moment we believed that the righteousness of God, the Bible says, was imputed unto us, which means to be accredited unto our account. But now that we ought to be righteous, there ought to be practical righteousness in our life. And I was talking to Pastor Gabe Swagger about this in his office just a few days ago about practical Christian living because some people think that if you just preach on the cross, then there's no need to preach on the practical Christian living. Uh, there is a saying I once heard, uh, uh, preach the cross, not the fruit basket. In other words, preach the cross, but don't preach on the fruit of the spirit. That's unbiblical. That's unscriptural. We preach on both the, the source and then we also preach on what that source should be producing in our life, the righteousness that should be produced in in our life each and every single day. Uh, Pastor Gabe and I were talking about this because, you know, I had made the, say, the statement that the cross is the foundation and that we then build upon that foundation. 
And somebody said out there, well, the cross isn't the foundation. The cross is the same, the, the whole house. No, the cross is the foundation and you build upon the foundation. Paul, he constantly spoke about building, laying a foundation and building upon the foundation. And so the cross is the foundation on the practical Christian living that you see in Romans chapters 12 through 16 and Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6. All of those things are on the basis, on the foundation of the cross of Jesus Christ and so we've got to preach on where righteousness comes from and then we also have to teach the Bible says that that grace teaches and we've also got to teach on what grace should be producing in our life if it's in the book then God put it in the book for a reason and we've got to preach on it and we've got to teach on it whether people like it or not Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yes. You know, Pastor Paris Reagan, he had invited me to come to a um, Crossfire Unite Fellowship down there in Baton Rouge. And him and I did a discussion uh, with those who were there. And we were talking about this very subject about uh, how when preachers, if preachers are preaching on prayer and preachers, if they do a series on fasting, it doesn't mean that they're not preaching the cross. If a preacher feels to do a series on leadership, the Bible teaches leadership. Um, if a preacher is uh, preaching on the gifts of the Spirit, if the preacher is preaching on blessing, if the preacher is preaching on anything that is found in this book and expounding on it and teaching on it, it does not mean that they're not preaching the cross. And I... I, I, I told Gabe, I said, I'm the kind of person I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. I'm not looking for something in their preaching and in their ministry to where I can disqualify them. I, I'm not looking, searching for something or waiting for them to say things just how I didn't want them to say it. That way I can write them off and, 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 and label them as, as not uh, being determined to preach the cross of Jesus Christ. That's not, that's not a mature thinking. That's not biblical thinking. Yes, we need to teach on Galatians. And yes, we need to teach on Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8. We need to teach on how sanctification takes place. And we also, we need to teach the entirety of the Word of God in light of that foundation. I told Brother Marty here, I said the other day over the phone, I said, any preacher that preaches here, if they feel to expound on prayer, or they feel to expound on fasting, or they feel to explain on, on leadership or blessing, I'm, I, I'm not in the least, I, I, there is, there's not a chance I'm going to think, well, maybe they're not preaching the cross anymore. No, because I know their foundation. I know that they're established in that foundation. And so I know whatever they're teaching on, it's in the sphere of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we need to preach on fasting and we need to preach on prayer. Jesus gave us the Lord's prayer for a reason. Je Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast. Amen. And so we've got to teach on fasting. And most of the time, the people who uh, are on the offense and attacking preachers for teaching on fasting and teaching on prayer, I oftentimes ask myself, have I ever heard them preach on prayer? Have I ever heard them teach on fasting? And so we can go from one extreme to the other. There are some who are teaching those things as a means of righteousness and as a means of getting victory over sin, trusting in their works rather than trusting in the finished work of Christ. So there's that extreme. And then the, there's the other extreme where people are afraid to preach on prayer and afraid to preach on fasting because they think that they might fall under law. No, you who are spiritual ought to understand that the cross is the foundation and prayer and fasting and blessing all of those things are found through the blood of Jesus Christ and we've got to preach it all hallelujah glory to God we got to preach every word in this book if it's in the book we're going to preach on it glory to God hallelujah glory to God Paul said he preached the full counsel of God. He preached every word in the book. He didn't shy away from any of it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we ought to preach on blessing. 
Some people are afraid to preach on blessing because they might get labeled as a prosperity preacher. And so you preach one message on the blessing of God, and they think that the preacher's prosperity, a quote-unquote prosperity preacher. Well, there is a prosperity message out there that puts the greater emphasis on the blessing than the blesser, but then there is a biblical prosperity message as well. The Bible said that God desires uh, for you to prosper even as your soul prospers. Prosperity, there is a biblical prosperity. I can feel some, where is he going with this? I'm, I'm sticking with the book. It's right here in the book. All you've got to do is read it. All you've, you, some of y'all need to get off Facebook and get your face in the book and come back to the Word of God. What does the Bible say? That's what we're going to preach. Hallelujah. You know, I, I love the story of the feeding of the 5,000 because the Bible said that when Jesus, you know, he would break it and break the bread and break the bread. And as he broke the bread, it would multiply and multiply and multiply. You know, God, he, he's good at math. God, God. He's got a book in the Bible called Numbers. If he wanted to, he could have provided exactly enough food for that crowd of 15 to 20,000 people at least. And as soon as that last person was fed, he could have cut it off. But Jesus didn't do that. He chose to give them overflow. He chose to give them more than enough. Don't ever let anybody stop you from believing a God whose name is more than enough from giving you just for, to, to give you just enough. A God whose name is more than enough will never stop at just enough. He said, I'll bless you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'll give you blessings that you don't even have room enough to receive them, that your containers cannot even contain. That's the kind of God that we serve. Not believing in the blessing of God does not make you humble. Not believing in the blessing of God means not believing in one of the benefits that was paid for you on Calvary's cross. I'm believing God to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ever ask or think. He said, call on me and I will show you. Not small and insignificant things, but he said, call on me and I will show you great and mighty things. I'm believing God for great and mighty things. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, I, I can't say that I'm living the dream because really what God has done in my life is far beyond anything I could have ever dreamed. But I'm believing God for even greater. I'm believing God for greater things. Glory to God. He said, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which he has prepared for you. That's the kind of God that we serve. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you don't want to believe God for, your, for blessing, then have at it. But we're a church that believes in the blessing of God. We're a church that asks God for the blessing. Hallelujah. We're people that expect the blessing of God. God is a blessing God. And God, he wants to bless his people. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We need to believe God for blessing. We need to believe God for healing. We need to believe God for deliverance. We need to believe God for increase. All of those things are on the basis of the cross of Jesus Christ. And he said, for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Kenneth Wiest, he states that this is not referring to justifying righteousness, but sanctifying righteousness, the righteousness that the Spirit is developing in us as we grow in the Lord by faith. He said, by faith, by faith, 
We are intensely desiring his righteousness to be developed in us. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. Hallelujah. When you seek him, and you seek his righteousness, everything that you need will be added unto you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, I love how the feeding of the 5,000, the Bible said that none of them had eaten. And yet they were choosing, there, there was such a hunger for the word of God that they were choosing to receive the word of God than phys- uh, more than they were physical bread. But Jesus said, I can not only give them the word, But I can also give them the bread. Not only can he meet your spiritual needs, but he can meet your physical needs. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of those things shall be added unto you. For we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. By faith. This isn't any kind of faith. This is the correct faith in Jesus Christ and I'm crucified. Everything that we have need of from God comes through faith. By grace, through faith. All you have to do is believe it. It really is that simple.